Today we want to introduce the cash coherence problem, and we want to do that by focusing on four different issues. The first is a description of bus-based multiprocessors, and then we go on to other issues that have more in relation to cash coherence. To start out with, we can describe multiprocessors by saying that the smallest ones have up to about 30 processors, and they are typified by shared memory. The uh, processors themselves may be on the same chip. You might have uh, multi-core processors used in a small-scale multiprocessor. They might have shared memory, and perhaps even they have a shared cache. Now, that's not very common when we talk about the L1 caches, but in the L2 caches, they very often are shared. Most processors today have multiprocessor support out of the box, which means you don't have to add anything to them to support uh, various multiprocessor organizations, uh, which include support for cache coherence. That, that tends to be built in in most processors today. And with multiprocessors so small, uh, you would expect the systems to be bus-based because it's not prohibitive to put that many devices on a single bus. As you move into larger scale multiprocessors, of course, it does become prohibitive, and then we need to work with different kinds of interconnection networks. Small-scale multiprocessors are used in the commercial marketplace as well as HPC markets, and, and a very common use of small-scale multiprocessors is as web servers. Medium-scale multiprocessors have shared memory, but they also work in clusters where a processor may be able to reach any of the memory in the cluster directly, but might have to go over a message passing type network to get to other clusters. The reason they build these systems in clusters is because they're cheaper, and often the clusters are clusters of SMPs. SMPs are symmetric multiprocessors like we described above in small scale multiprocessors. Now when we move on to large-scale multiprocessors, we very rarely sh see shared memory, but we see lots of cluster organizations so that maybe the memory will be shared within the cluster, but again, you have to use message passing to get outside the cluster. However, software can build upon that a shared memory abstraction, as we'll see uh, a little bit later on. Uh, typical of these is the SGI Altix 3300, which is a few years old now, but it's a 512 processor shared memory machine. Now, when I say NUMA, that means non-uniform memory access. So that's one of those in which you can access local memory very quickly, but accessing memory that's non-local takes a little bit longer. These are uh, interconnected by a large variety of components. Some of the kinds of uh, networking that, that are used are Beowulf cl clusters, which are clusters of commodity PCs that don't have monitors or keyboards. Miranet, which is based on fiber optics. It's a high-speed local networking system connected by routers and switches. It has almost a 2 gigabit sustained throughput, which is a lot better than, than Ethernet. By Amdahl's law, that's even more important to performance since networking tends to be the bottleneck in these large multiprocessors. The SP2 is IBM's scalable system based upon the power chip, uses the HPS high performance switch and a bidirectional tree based organization. What are the advantages of shared memory? Shared memory, first of all, supports the shared memory programming abstraction out of the box, so to speak. You don't have to build it on top of message passing, and because of that, it supports it efficiently for a large range of parallel algorithms. Clusters can also support shared memory via software shared virtual memory, but the fact that the overhead is higher to get from a processor to data in another part of the memory means that the granularity of sharing is limited. You can't communicate back and forth very quickly. You can't have processors that are sharing the same page if you need to move the page back and forth over the network every time another processor needs to access it. Shared memory allows fine-grained sharing, and that means you can communicate every few instructions. You can't do that with messages because of the overhead of packaging up the message and transporting it and then retrieving it at the other end. Shared memory multiprocessors also have a single operating system image, so the operating system can control all the nodes, whereas if there's no shared memory, a large part of the operating system has to be replicated on each node. What's the disadvantage of shared memory machines if they have all these all these advantages? 
Well, I think pretty obviously it's a, it's, it's a uh, speed cost trade-off. The cost of providing the shared memory abstraction is much higher. So you're paying for that fine-grained communication. And for a lot of applications, it's not worthwhile to pay that much. Let's take a look at a block diagram of a bus-based multiprocessor. You can see that there is a cache, actually a shared L2 cache here, and there are processor modules that are also on the bus. Uh, I was wondering what this P hyphen PR space O means, and I think that that's originally from a slide where these were Pentium Pro modules, so it's prob about, probably about 15 years old, but the general structure is still in use today. We've got a shared bus that connects the CPU and all of these uh, modules. And uh, so the processors are on one side and the memory is on another side. And also the external devices, the I.O. devices, are on the other side. So I think that sets the stage for our consideration of coherence.